The Winnipeg Jets have lost yet another game, falling to the Minnesota Wild 4-2. What does Bones even say to a team that outshot its opponents 2-1 while still generally dominating play and finding a way to lose? Can this team right the ship and get back on track? Are the Jets really that close to maybe missing the playoffs? What does Winnipeg do over the next few weeks to try and get things back under control? All coming right up on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Now, like I said at the top of the episode, the Jets have lost yet again. And at this point, Winnipeg is basically just looking for answers as to how to try and fix the situation. You know, the Jets were a team that basically dominated Minnesota from the the, the, the drop of the puck. They outshot them by like a factor of two to one. Uh, I, I think what Mark Andre Fleury had to make like 43 saves, and yet at the end of the day, the Jets still lost four to two. And you might be wondering, well, you know, what is there to take away from this game in which the Jets kind of got goalied, right? What is the principal problem? And the issue that we've talked about for the past several months, something that was kind of, you know, a, a thought at the uh, start of the season and during the off season is that the Jets just don't really have enough finishing talent. I mean, it was a problem back then, and then for like a couple of months we thought, oh, you know, maybe the Jets are going to be able to get by with this team, uh, a top six that is a little bit top-heavy, and a bottom six that's not going to score much. Maybe, you know, if Hellebuck continues to be <clears throat> at the level of like a Vesna caliber goalie that he was at the start of the season, perhaps the Jets can pull this off. But as we've gone through the last uh, month and a half or two, we've seen kind of the opposite start to take over. The Jets are very much running up against their own weaknesses, and now all of the issues with the team structure and the roster construction, it's all being laid bare. And I think for me, you know, I don't know that Bones can really say much at this point other than just to uh, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, the Jets got close to beating Minnesota, but at the end of the day, close is kind of small comfort when uh, you've basically lost eight of your last 10 games and the Jets are finding themselves very close to potentially missing the playoffs. As of right now, you know, we're going to dive into uh, the NHL standings later, but the Jets are in the second wild card spot with Calgary just a scant four points behind them. So if ever there was pressure on Winnipeg to really perform, it's now. I mean, the Jets are really in danger of basically squandering a second place divisional hold, you know, by some models, the Jets went from like a 90% uh, playoff lock to now sitting, you know, just above 60%. So things have been really dire. Things have been really rough. Uh, I I guess the bright side is that, you know, Niederreiter continues to be really fun. He's been a a phenomenal find for the Jets. Again, only cost a second round pick. We also have Logan Stanley scoring a goal, which is kind of funny. This goal was actually uh, really pretty when you think about it. Stanley had an activation below the goal line and actually looked very confident in scoring what was a great wraparound opportunity. Not really something that you associate with him. Uh, Maybe he should do it more often instead of firing from like a million miles away. But uh, speaking of Stanley, you know, he, he didn't exactly have the world's best game. But one weird thing that did happen was that uh, he kind of like folded Ka- Kirill Kaprizov over. It was like a reverse hit or something that Kaprizov tried to throw, and Stanley's just not really coordinated and kind of fell on top of him. 
Very strange. Kaprizov is now slated to miss like three to four weeks. Uh, Stanley, I don't even think, got called for anything in the game, and I doubt he would ever be suspended for it. It was more unintentional, but man, yeah, you do not want a six seven guy of Stanley's size like rolling over the top of a skater who's maybe half his height. So not pretty to see uh, Kaprizov missing the next month is going to be really rough for the, the Wild. I mean, Kirill is arguably one of their most important players, probably their most important player other than like Philip Gustafson. He's been their breadwinning, you know, attacker. We talked about him as the player to watch out for. So, yeah, I guess the only other thing to really say about this game is that I'm really tired of Marcus Foligno. Dude sniped one over uh, Hellebuck's shoulder, which is just I don't understand. Like he turns into Wayne Gretzky every time he plays the Jets. If he's not injuring one of our players, he's scoring some stupid goal. <clears throat> really, really tired of seeing this man. I can't wait till he retires. But, you know, for the Jets, uh, I mean, Bones kind of said, we don't really have to change anything. We just need to play like this against another opponent. You know, if we play with this level of, of intensity and play this well, things will change and, and get to a point where you start to see more wins. And that might be true, but the Jets also have just a handful of games left in the regular season to turn things around. So all I can say is the Jets are going to have to make some lineup configuration changes. I think we're seeing that trying to elevate certain players who are most honestly, you know, sort of a depth guy, not not really um, the high end scorer that you want, maybe paired with some of your more elite players and then the benching of Ehlers repeatedly. This stuff just can't keep happening. Sandberg really shouldn't be getting scratched. Ehlers should not be playing on the third line. You know, Winnipeg is just finding itself kind of staring at the bottom of the barrel and hoping to find, I don't know, gold or something at the bottom. But, you know, the longer you look down there, the less you're likely to dredge up. So I want to dive into the NHL standings in a little bit and kind of take a look at where the Jets are, are sort of starting to sweat. I mean, this is a legitimate concern from a team that thought a playoff lock was basically inevitable that had a, a shot at winning the division. Now the Jets are staring a potential exit before proceedings even begin. And they're really hoping that the Calgary Flames and Nashville Predators don't exactly have the best end of their seasons. But unfortunately for the Jets, Winnipeg's schedule is pretty hard and the Flames have a much easier run. So not a good time. But hey, if the Jets miss, I guess... Uh, they're not the only teams that have essentially fumbled some of the bag, so to speak. We'll dive into what other teams have gone from being playoff locks to looking like they're just going to straight up miss. We'll dive into that in just a moment. But before we go any further, I do want to shout out our friends at FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. New customers get a no sweat first bet of up to one thousand dollars. That's bonus bets back if your first bet does not win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. You can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to the number of threes drained. I don't really follow basketball myself personally, but I know a lot of you probably do. Uh, you maybe are trying to track LeBron's historic run and kind of maybe interested in casting a bet on where he finishes the season with his career milestones and points. Maybe you want to guess how many threes Steph is going to drain. You know, his days are definitely starting to wind down as a top and player, but he still has it, still has some of that magic touch and can still hit a three better than almost anyone. Or maybe you just want to bet on who you think the next champion is going to be. The NBA has a tight competitive field this year, and maybe you think the Celtics are going to find some really tough opponents as they run towards the playoffs. No matter what you bet on, though, uh, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at an even bigger payout with the same game parlay. Don't miss your chance to get your no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for joining us on tonight's episode. Uh, we just sort of talked about the Jets finding a way to lose that game against the Minnesota Wild after dominating proceedings for most of the evening, just couldn't get across the finish line. Uh, the, the, the lack of scoring again bites the Jets. And I, I said that the Jets are kind of in danger of missing the playoffs. 
you know, we're going to dive into the NHL standings and kind of see how teams are, are faring this year and, and, and really why the Jets are suddenly starting to break a little bit of a sweat. Now, kicking off the Western Conference, I usually start with the East, but we'll go with the West this time. Give our uh, wonderful rivals some love. In the Central Division, you've got Dallas, Minnesota, and Colorado an- anchoring the top three spots. The Stars haven't exactly had the best run of form recently either, but uh, it seems like recently past night or so, they have kind of started to maybe stabilize. This is still a really good Stars team, and for, you know, for this team, even when they were bad, they were losing in like overtime and stuff, uh, but they've also had such a strong, firm hold on that first spot uh, that you know it, it never really seemed like it was in particular danger where the Jets would keep losing games consistently. Dallas might alternate, you know, one night win, one night lose, uh, while the Jets are just racking up losses left and right. So the Stars, they've been in firm uh, pole position for much of the season, probably going to win the Central, but maybe Colorado has other plans. Right behind them uh, are the Minnesota Wild, who, uh, well, after getting dominated, end up, you know, ended up still winning against the Jets. Now, the Kaprizov thing does actually have a pretty big ramification for the rest of their season. You know, without Kirdil for the next several weeks, Minnesota looks a lot less dangerous. It's going to be down to uh, Philip Gustafson and that, I would imagine, because, I mean, you saw the Wild. They only scored, you know, a couple of goals before the Jets kind of gifted them some stuff. And, you know, that offense really relies on Kaprizov, especially on the power plays. So this team has lost one of its most star contributors, I wouldn't be shocked if for the next few weeks they start to take a bit of a step back, uh, especially after having such a really strong run of form recently going 8-0-2. Now, the team that everyone is probably expecting to win the Central now, the team that is like the quiet predator in waiting, it's the Colorado Avalanche. We know Colorado is just one of those teams that, you know, when they turn it on, when they're really feeling things, you can't stop them. I know that their team is not as good as it was in, in previous seasons, uh, even compared to last year's cup team. It's not as deep, but who gives a frick, man? I mean, this team always seems to find ways to be that top end playoff competitor that must beat opponent, the one that cannot be stopped, the one that you really want to beat in the regular season to prove that you might have what it takes to win the cup in a few months. But you know, the Avs, man, it's not really shocking. They've got 76 points. They've got three games in hand on the other uh, members of the Central Division at the top. I mean, it's going to be tough for anyone to stop them. And come playoff time, I would not be surprised if at the end of all of this, after everything the Eastern Conference did, you know, Colorado has a cakewalk to the finals and ends up winning anyways, because that's just a very Avs thing, isn't it? Now, out in the Pacific, we have an interesting race. The Pacific this year is actually the stronger of the two divisions, at least to me. Uh, but, I mean, this is all kind of in relative terms, if we're being honest. But the the star power and the intrigue of the, or of the uh, Pacific division this year, you've got Vegas, L.A., and Seattle. And all of these teams have some major flaws and, you know, weaknesses and absences due to injuries. But somehow, I mean, they're still very compelling competitors. Vegas is still that annoying pest of a team that plays a fast-paced counter game. You don't want to really doubt them because uh, Vegas has the ability to turn it around in the postseason. Though, with the way the roster is this year, I'm not as confident in that. I do think that the first round or two might be it for them. LA, LA, another one of those teams that I wouldn't really bet a lot of money on. Very, very high-octane offense. Plays very good hockey, but they concede so much. Now, Quick is gone. Uh, maybe Copley or someone else steps up. But yeah, the goaltending situation for them is kind of like their Achilles heel. But even with all of that, they're 7 2 and 1 over, over their last 10. They're on a four game winning streak. They're currently beating uh, the Avs 4 to 2. So maybe it doesn't even matter at the end of the day. Uh, this Kings team, I think people have slept on them a lot over the past year or so. Every time I watch them, I come away really impressed. So. Tough team, tough competitor, and the Kraken are just behind them. Seattle, another surprise for a lot of people. There were some folks coming into the season who thought that they might finally turn things around and look more like a competitive team. Seems like the Kraken have really uh, managed to make the most of having three or four pretty good lines, even if 
the lack of star power at times is apparent. Still a really well-disciplined team. You know, again, pretty decent squad up and down the roster. Not too many clear and obvious holes other than just high-end elite finishing, but that hasn't really stopped them from being one of the highest-scoring offenses in the NHL. So evidently they've got something that they're cooking up there. In the wild cards, you've got Edmonton and Winnipeg. And like I said, this is kind of where the Jets are starting to find themselves sweating a bit. Um, the Oilers are going to be almost impossible to flip out of that first wild card spot because the Jets just aren't going to win enough at this rate. I think the Oilers have managed to outscore and basically just rely on McDavid enough to where, you know, the Jets, I don't think, reasonably have a great shot of catching them. Uh, instead, Winnipeg's really going to be fighting to hold on to the second wild card spot. And with Calgary, uh, just a scant four points behind them and seemingly on the verge of turning their season around over the past couple of games. Yeah, Winnipeg, it's it's rough. Uh, Calgary's schedule is also very easy, whereas the Jets have like a pretty middle-of-the-pack schedule difficulty, maybe slightly harder than average. Not fun. And then behind all of that, you've got the Preds sitting there with 69 points and four games in hand. So not a team that you, you, know, you can necessarily write off. I know that they kind of suck, you know, this year, but comparatively speaking, so have the Jets. So not a team that I think is is safe to write off yet. And if they win even two of those games that they've got in hand, suddenly things are looking really tough for the Jets. <sighs> How did it ever come to this, man? How did Winnipeg manage to blow such an easy opportunity to uh, really add and build a team to make a competitor and really take advantage of a second place spot in the central, turned it into a title run. Instead, the Jets are well, at this point just fighting to stay in the playoffs. So, yeah, all I can say is not having a good time. And uh, I, I just <laughs> I'm so annoyed, but it is what it is. That's what the life of a Jets fan is like. Now, I guess I've commiserated and, and we're all sort of annoyed. But imagine being a fan of an Eastern team. We're going to take a look at the Eastern standings because they are absolutely ridiculous right now. We are probably looking at the conference with the actual uh, future Stanley Cup champ, and we'll dive into which of these teams might be standing uh, at the end, uh, hoisting the trophy over their heads in just a little bit. Hello, friends, and welcome back to these closing thoughts in tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets. We are diving into uh, the standings updates right now and taking a look at, you know, the Eastern Conference. We just did the West tight picture there, but the East is even more insane. Uh, I would say it's not as close, but the top end performers here have started putting up like historical records. So out in the Metro, you've got a really strong front three. You've got Carolina, New Jersey and the Rangers. The Rangers are definitely not in the same tier uh, as Carolina and New Jersey, both of those teams are very consistent. They have been offensively ambitious. Um, of course, New, New Jersey got Timo Meyer. He's fit on like a glove, and he's already scored. The Canes have a very strong two-way team, uh, very powerful offense. You know, the finishing talent maybe not as good, but Gostas Bear has been a natural fit, apparently doing a lot better than I thought he was going to do. And it just seems like the Metro is... Uh, one of the strongest divisions um, in all of the NHL, and it would have been the strongest this year if the Atlantic didn't happen. This year, <laughs> man, what do you even say about the Boston Bruins that hasn't been said already? Just hear this for a moment. They have a plus 104 goal differential. Plus 104. I think the next closest is like plus 59, and that's Carolina. Can you imagine having a team that has scored over 100 more goals than they've conceded? I mean, you just never see that. You just really never see that. This team is 49-9-5, and, and I hate the Bruins with all of my being. I hate the Bruins, but even I am amazed at what they've accomplished this year. This team feels like the most locked-on, like dead-set Stanley Cup champion team I've ever seen. I, I don't know how they could possibly lose. I know that that's one of those things where the playoffs start to be a little bit different. But look, man, if the Bruins somehow get knocked out, I would actually be kind of pissed. I just feel like that would be the most frustrating and kind of unrewarding reality of, of how random the playoffs are. And that's why everyone always loves the chaos. They love the uncertainty. But me, 
I think if you're a team that's doing what the Bruins are doing and how they've accomplished it, you just deserve to win the cup. Uh, but there's no deserving in this league. There's no easy handouts. And I think Boston is going to fight for every inch. Right behind them, they've got Toronto and Tampa Bay. Both of those teams are right behind them, I say in the standings, but they are like 20 points clear. So, yeah, no one's touching the first place in the East. Uh, no one is coming close to the Bruins. And it, it just, yeah, what can you even say about this this division and conference that hasn't been set already? Now, the wild card race is curious. You've got the Islanders and Pens, and uh, not too far behind them are the Panthers. Washington looks like they're falling out, so I wouldn't really worry about them. The Suns and Sabres have also kind of uh, fallen back, same with the Red Wings. So Islanders and Pittsburgh, probably safe to say that they are most likely going to make the play playoffs with uh, the rest of the East not exactly being able to catch up. Unless the Panthers suddenly turn things around, uh, you're looking at a lock for the Metro because um, the Metro is, is not as good at the top end as uh, the Pacific, but like the rest of the middle of the pack teams are more of a pain in the butt to deal with. And so, yeah, I mean, whew, how are you supposed to win against anyone in the East? The only Western team that I could see really having success is Colorado and they're losing to the Kings right now. So uh, a fascinating playoff picture, I think for me, um, this is one of those weird ones where there's a very clear team that I think should win everything and probably won't because hockey again is kind of random. But again, if the Bruins somehow lose, I'm just going to be in disbelief. I've never really seen a season like this in my lifetime, uh, especially with the salary cap era being what it is. We've seen dominant teams, but again, nothing quite like this. Give me your prediction of who you think is going to win the Stanley Cup. Is it going to be Boston or do you think another team might see them out and uh, capture glory? Drop your predictions in the comments below or at my social medias at, Shirley, at HL Living Loco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. Make your second listen Game to Game NHL. Every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NHL with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NHL, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, signing off for this evening. Thanks for making us your first listen of the day. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And as always, go Jets go.